I'm happy today to be able to talk to you about cross-examination. You know, it's a topic that scares a lot of us. It's scary because you're not controlling this witness. This isn't the witness that you got to meet with in your office. And it's not a witness who's going to be particularly friendly to you in many cases. And because of that, it requires a certain amount of preparation. And there's certain rules that I think should be followed in almost every case, if not every case, when it comes to cross-examination. So let's talk about some of those. My rule number one is that we cross with an eye toward closing argument. The idea behind cross-examination for me is to get the ammunition I'm going to need to be able to make an effective closing argument down the road. If I'm asking more than that, I'm probably asking for too much. And if I'm not asking that much, then I haven't asked enough. So as we get this information on cross-examination, we're looking at two things. One, what can we do to help our theory of the case, our theory of why our client should win? Many times, witnesses have some information that's helpful to us. That information supports our theory of the case. And, but the other possibility is that we help our theory of the case by getting information that hurts our opponent's theory. Hurts our opponent's theory by either bringing out facts that are, again, helpful to us, but also by attacking the credibility of the opponent's witnesses to show that their testimony that was supporting their theory is just not believable. Certain things that you want to avoid in cross-examination. Don't repeat the direct unnecessarily. I think that's a mistake that many of us make because when we start off, we're nervous. And so it's easy to just sit there and say, well, now, didn't you just say this? And didn't you just say that? The, the problem with that is that if we didn't like that testimony with the first time we heard it, then why do we want to repeat it and have somebody have to hear it again, have our fact finder have to hear it again? Another mistake that oftentimes we make is to ask that one question too many. And that goes back to the point about we're crossing with an eye toward closing. Get the ammunition you need and don't go too far. I had this experience personally not two weeks ago. I was in a hearing cross-examining an expert witness. It was not in front of a jury, it was in front of a judge. I got the expert to admit that within his report he had not included certain information. He hadn't included more recent information in his report in reaching a conclusion. I had everything I needed, and I should have shut up. But instead, I couldn't stop myself from saying, so wouldn't you agree then that that really qualifies the report that you gave and qualifies your conclusion? And the expert looked at me and said, no, counsel, I wouldn't, and here's why. And I got an answer I didn't want to hear. So avoid that one question too many. Avoid extraneous issues. Remember, the case is about your theory of the case and their theory of the case. Don't get into side issues that aren't going to help your theory, that aren't going to help the story of innocence or the story of injustice that you're trying to portray to your fact finder. Recognize how your cross fits within your entire case theory and recognize how your cross fits within your entire case presentation. Don't try to do too much with a witness. If you have a witness on cross-examination who you're trying to get helpful information from, ask yourself, do I need that information from this witness or will my witness down the road give me that same information? Chances are your witness is going to be a lot more friendly about giving it to you than the opponent's witness. Now, sometimes you have to attack that opponent's witness. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, don't try to do too much with a witness on cross-examination. On cross-examination, if you want to get 
helpful information, do it first. You got to hug them first. But when you hug them, don't forget what Lyndon B. Johnson said. Hug your friends tight, but your enemies tighter. Hug them so tight, they can't wiggle. Cross-examination is about control. It's about making sure that you control that witness throughout the entire examination. And when you've finished hug them, hugging them, when you've finished having that opportunity to get things that are helpful to your case out, then it's time to hit them. One of the reasons why you want to hit them at that point, and hitting them usually means attacking witness credibility, at least in part, is that once you go negative, once you become adversarial, you can't go back to being friendly very easily. And so the next step after you've hugged them is to hit them, and then you're attacking witness credibility as part of that. How do we attack witness credibility? In general, we attack witnesses on one or more of three fronts. Their ability to perceive. The sun was in your eyes. There was a tree blocking your view. You couldn't hear from where you were. You were far away. You're colorblind, whatever the case may be. Another way is the ability to remember. This was six months ago. This was three years ago. You have short-term memory loss. Whatever the case might be, the ability to remember is the second way that we attack a witness's credibility. And thirdly, we attack on the ability to accurately relate information. That usually means the witness's bias. Sometimes a witness saw things correctly, they remember it exactly, but when they're out there communicating it, relating it to the fact finder on the stand, their bias gets in the way and they shade their testimony. And that's what we have to work on in developing on cross-examination. So once again, those are our big points on attacking witness credibility. Okay, we've talked about some of the big goals, but how do we do it? How do we cross-examine? Remember to keep your questions short. And questions don't always have to be in the form of a question. Unless a judge is giving you a hard time about it, Ask your questions as short declarative statements, one building on top of the other, one topic per question. So, for example, it was sunny, you were driving, you were driving on East 185th Street, traffic was light. Each of those is a single question. Now, every so often, you'll have somebody on the other side who will say, Objection! That's not a question. I've got a friend down in North Carolina, Steve Lindsay, who can get away with this, who sat there one time when that happened. He looked at the prosecutor and he said, That's not a question? The prosecutor said, No, that's not a question. Steve looked at the judge and said, He just answered it. The fact of the matter is that if a judge allows you to use short declarative statements as questions, it's a good way of keeping control. If you can't do that, then you have to go to things like, is it fair to say? Isn't it a fact that? But make sure whatever you do, you're, you're leading at all times. Now use headlines when appropriate. I know you've known about headlines from direct examination. But headlines and cross are a little bit different because we don't want to unnecessarily tip off the witnesses to where we're going. But there are times when headlines will work. Okay, I want to take you back to December 2nd at about 5 p.m. and let's talk about what you were doing there. That's the kind of headline that tells the jury where you're going and doesn't necessarily uh, hurt you in terms of tipping off a witness. At the same time, don't do it too much. Don't do it as much on cross as you do on direct as a general matter. So those are our four points, short declarative statements, one topic per question, building on the next question, using headlines when appropriate. Lead. And when I say lead, I mean lead. Don't give the witness the opportunity to wiggle. Now that does not mean that you say to a witness, I just want a yes or no answer. That's objectionable in most courtrooms. 
and a judge can stop you from doing that. And certainly if your opponent does that, you should object. And it doesn't look good to the jury because it's in effect saying to the jury, I can't handle the truth. That's not the message you want to send. The message is you ask a good, simple, tight question. And if the witness is not answering it, it's the witness who looks bad because it's the witness who's looking as if they're trying to hide something. So a good question is, it was sunny. Notice the short declarative statement. Not, was it sunny? Was it sunny is still kind of leading. I mean, the non-leading form would be, what was the weather like? But was it sunny doesn't give you as much control as when you say, it was sunny. Why do we want that control? We want that control, first of all, to keep that witness from wiggling. But it does something else, too. It communicates to a jury that I know what's going on in this case. I'm in control. And, in many cases, the only way you can believe that witness is when I take the words and pull them right out of that witness's mouth. And so maximum control requires leading, and cross-examination is about control. Now, there's seven words you cannot say on cross-examination. Okay, maybe you can say them, but be careful with these. Who? Who did something? No. Mr. Thomas did something. What? What happened next? No. Tell the witness what happened next. Then you went to the driveway. When? When did this occur? This occurred at 5 p.m. That's what you want to say. Where did this occur? No. This occurred at East 185th Street and Lakeshore Boulevard. Why? My gosh, whatever you do, don't ask the why question on cross-examination because you'll get the answer that you don't want to hear. You don't ask the witness to give you a reason why the witness did something. You tell the witness the reason why the witness did that. And you were scared. Not, why did you run away? How? Same thing. How did you do something? No. Tell the witness how they did it. The last one is compare. Compare the speed of the red car to the blue car? No. The red car was driving faster than the blue car. That's the leading form. Notice, too, that these questions, who or words, who, what, when, where, why, how, compare, those are the exact same words that you're using in direct examination to make sure that your questions are not leading. So let's talk about controlling that uncontrollable witness, that witness that we're always worried about. Uncontrollable witnesses come in a couple of different varieties. One is the evasive witness. The evasive witness can't give you a straight answer uh, to save his or her life. Expert witnesses are oftentimes evasive witnesses. As Margaret Thatcher says, do not lie shamelessly. Sometimes evasiveness is necessary. And some witnesses apparently are strong advocates of Margaret Thatcher's words in this regard. There's a couple of techniques to deal with the evasive witness that you might find helpful. One is to take their answer and take your question and make the converse of your question and see how they react to that. So let's try that for a second, okay? You were driving down East 185th Street, yes. It was raining, yes. The pavement was wet. Well, I wouldn't really say wet. So you were raining and the pavement was dry? See, the converse places them in a bad spot. And in a situation like that, you might get an answer that agrees with you. Another technique is after the witness is evasive and tends to ramble on a little bit, is to look at the witness and say, so the answer to my question is yes, or the answer to my question is no, and frequently that will bring them back as well. So the first step 
of course, with the evasive witness is to make sure those questions are tight and that they're leading. But those other two techniques, the converse and the answer to my question is yes or the answer to my question is no, are also techniques that you might be able to find help you with dealing with the evasive witness. And remember something else about the evasive witness. The jury sees what's going on. And trust that jury or your fact finder. They know when a witness is trying to be squirrely with you. Now that evasive witness is one form of our uncontrollable witness. Another one is the runaway witness. Now that's the witness that when asked what time it is proceeds to not only tell you the time in five different time zones, but also proceeds to tell you how to make a clock. That's the witness who's the human filibuster and just continues on and numbs the jury and, or the fact finder, uh, if not to sleep, then maybe even to death. What do you do with that runaway witness? With the runaway witness, the secret is to watch them and find that opportunity to interrupt them without looking like you're being rude. The way to do that for me is I start by kind of just watching their mouth. I'm looking to see if they're going to take a breath. Everybody's got to take one at some point. And when I'm watching and I wait to see that breath start to be taken, I'll jump in and I'll just say anything to stop them. So I'll say, well, uh, let me ask you this. And I've stopped the flow and I've been able to take control of the situation again. That's one technique. Some friends of mine maintain that if it gets really bad, you just do the traffic cop and you say, stop. Stop. And another technique that I've been told uh, some folks like to use, um, I've never used it maybe because I spent too much time in Catholic school and am used to having my full name being recited, is to look at the witness and call them by name. Joseph Miller. What I'm asking you is, and sometimes that will bring them back, people respond to that by shutting up. Like the evasive witness, the runaway witness is apparent to the jury. They're not scoring as many points as you might think. And so when it comes to the runaway witness, don't worry. Stay on them. Ask your tight questions. Look for the ways to interrupt and look for a way to get that witness back on track. Using emotions. And using emotions is an important consideration in CROSS. And especially when you have those uncontrollable witnesses. They're getting you mad. Do you use anger? Do you use some type of a sympathetic approach? What emotion do you use in cross-examining? It goes back to the fact of what's your theory of the case? What's your theory of the case about this witness? Is this witness evasive because he has an ax to grind against your client? Is this witness uncontrollable because they're simply someone who is scatterbrained? The person with the bias you might find you need to deal with more severely. The person who's scatterbrained more sympathetically. Control your emotions. Your emotions have to be part of your presentation and have to be consistent with your theory of the case. Whatever you do, don't be a bully. Juries don't like it. Judges won't put up with it at some point. Don't be a bully. It's for that reason that I would never say to a witness, now I'm going to ask you a question, I just want a yes or no answer. That's being a bully. You ask the question in such a way that you'll get that yes or no answer with a short, tight, leading question. But don't beat up on the witness. You're looked upon as being the person who's in a position of authority. Don't abuse it. Handling objections during cross-examination. 
You're up there, you're on a roll, you're asking questions, and the other side makes an objection. And sometimes that objection is being made for no reason other than to try to throw you off track. First, wait for a ruling. Don't withdraw your question if a judge doesn't say that you have to. Second, don't give up the subject matter unless the judge makes it absolutely clear that you have to. So an objection can be made, maybe there's been a sidebar, maybe it's a speaking objection if the judge permits it, and your opponent has said, objection, that's irrelevant. Don't, just because it's sustained, say, oh, I guess I can't go into this. Hearsay is a good example of that. Objection, it's hearsay. Well, think about if there's a non-hearsay way to get that same information out. Or think about whether or not you can ask that witness, you had a conversation, and maybe the next statement was the one that they said was objectionable because of hearsay, but you can still say, after that conversation, you did X, Y, Z. And that can portray to the jury exactly what took place in that situation. Of course, as with any objection, have a good legal reason for asking your question. Be ready to respond to the objection to begin with. But don't give up the subject matter unless you must. And finally, be ready to proffer if you haven't been permitted to get into an area on cross-examination. Make sure you have a good, comprehensive proffer to preserve that issue for the record. Wait for a ruling. Don't give up the subject matter and a good proffer. Let's talk about graphics for a second. You know, more and more, we're a visual society. We don't decide elections anymore on the basis of great oratory. We decide them on the basis of 60-second spots for the most part. Those of us of a certain age learned much more under an oral tradition of professors who lectured to us than my children do now, where there's a smart board and there's graphics and there's much more use of video and, and the like in the, in the classroom and all kinds of other stuff that my kids would roll their eyes and say, Dad, you don't even know what that stuff is. And so as a graphic society, there are ways that we need to, as lawyers, use those graphics and defend against those graphics during the course of our trial. Judge Marcus shared some information with me that in terms of our sources of information, sight accounts for at least 70% of the information we take in. Hearing, maybe 20. And all the other senses combined, maybe 10%. Case in point, you're not listening to me right now. You're watching me right now. So how do we deal with our opponent's graphics? Big charts have gone up in direct examination. PowerPoints have gone up during direct examination. What are we going to do to deal with what may have been a riveting visual presentation that's been made? Well, first, let's make sure during cross-examination that if we don't want the jury to look at a particular graphic, we get it out of their sight. If a witness has just spent time with diagrams on an easel, let's take those diagrams and put them down. Let's turn off the PowerPoint from the other side before we start. Because if we didn't like it the first time the jury saw it, the last thing in the world we want to do is to turn around and let them continue to see it and distract the witness from our cross. How do we respond to our opponent's graphics, and when do we respond to our opponent's graphics? There's a couple of things to think about here. Sometimes we respond with the same witness. In other words, on cross-examination, we cross-examine their witness about their own graphics. Sometimes we wait, and we have our witness describe those graphics and explain them away. 
That, of course, then becomes part of direct examination, and that's not really part of this lecture today. When adverse counsel, when adverse counsel renews their attention to a graphic, draws the attention again of the jury to that graphic, that's a sign for you to be ready to respond because you want to respond in a timely fashion. So if they're pounding something on direct examination, chances are you need to talk about it on cross-examination. You can't necessarily wait until your case in chief down the road. And when you do respond, make that graphic your own. Make it become your visual object. And it becomes your visual object either because you're going to make good use of it or because you're going to undercut the credibility of their use of it. So think about which witness it's going to be. Think about timing in terms of how the adverse counsel has used that graphic. And then when you do attack that graphic or use that graphic, make it your own. There's possible responses to your opponent's graphics. And you know, we talked before about how do we cross-examine witnesses. We hug them, then we hit them. Do the same thing with the graphic. Hug it, then hit it, because you're doing it through a witness. Maybe further explanation is necessary with respect to a graphic. You're saying that the error rate on your graphic here is 6%. That means that it's correct 94% of the time? Might be the kind of thing that you would point out on a graphic. Sometimes you need to add some more marks to a diagram. The opponent has had a diagram, they've marked it up at different places, and now it's your turn. And you take that same witness and you add other key facts. Well, I want to talk to you about a couple of things that you didn't mention in direct examination on that diagram. Now, there's a tree right over here by this stop sign, isn't there? And maybe you'll draw in that tree or whatever it might be that you do to show the jury the rest of the picture. Similarly, you may want to just bring that back and put it up again and run a jury, uh, run the witness through that diagram one more time for purposes of the jury, not repeating the direct, but getting to certain salient points. Further display is part of further explanation. The bottom line, though, is that you hug that exhibit if it can help you. Now, there's another set of possible responses to your opponent's graphics, and that's when you have to hit them. The diagram's not reliable. It's not drawn to scale. Uh, the photograph uh, that you're showing is at an angle. It doesn't really show perspective correctly. You need to ask short questions, not the conclusion. That's what you're going to argue to the, uh, to the jury, but the kinds of short, tight, leading questions of this was taken at a 25 degree angle. This was taken from a perspective that was 50 feet away. It was not taken head on, whatever the case might be, to show that it's not reliable. Maybe it's a piece of real evidence and it's not authentic. And you attack it because of the fact that, you know, this is, for whatever reason, not authentic. Think about your best evidence rule with respect to that. Um, copies are as admissible in most situations as the original. But there are times when an attack on authenticity might need to take place with respect to something. Because remember, graphics aren't always just demonstrative evidence. Sometimes the graphics are the real evidence. Sometimes graphics aren't paper either. Don't lose track of the fact that when I talk about graphics here, that includes any physical exhibit, anything that graphically communicates to a jury that appeals to that sense of of sight uh, as opposed to that sense of hearing. And finally, bias. The bias that may have gone into the person who prepared 
that chart or that diagram. The bias of a diagram or a chart is frequently a matter of the bias of the witness. And so cross-examining on bias is, of course, essential in that regard. Now, there's another way that we sometimes use graphics. A friend of mine in Cleveland has had very good success of using his own graphics on cross-examination with a flip chart. He takes the flip chart and he'll sit there with the witness and he'll say, so do I understand that you were approximately 50 feet away from whatever the case might be? Witness says yes. Okay, well let's just write that down. And he'll sit there and he'll write down per the witness's name, 50 feet away. And he'll look at the witness and say, did I write that correctly? Yes. And he'll use that at various times for certain key points in the cross-examination. And remember how we crossed with an eye toward closing? When closing argument comes, he pulls out that flip chart and he starts going through it. Do you remember what the witness said? Boom, boom, boom. Is that diagram going to go back to the jury? No. But in effect, he makes those words come alive again for the jury during closing argument. Let's talk about a specific portion of cross-examination that needs to be done well and needs to be done tight. And that's impeachment with prior statements. And there's steps to impeachment with prior statements. If you know those steps, you can control the witness. First, some preliminaries. You must know the documents in your case. You have to be well prepared. You have to know those documents better than the witness, him or herself. And you must have prove up ready whatever that may be. If they've given a prior oral statement, then you have to have a witness ready to go in your case in chief or on rebuttal that will uh, impeach them with the prior oral statement. Or you have to have a transcript ready to be uh, introduced if it comes to that, if you don't have a stipulation to the transcript in case the witness denies having given that prior statement, whatever the case might be. You must determine where impeachment fits in your order of cross. I do not recommend that you start with impeachment or that you end with impeachment. And the reason why is because impeachment sometimes can get a little bit messy. And you want to end strong. You want to start crisp. And so impeachment someplace in the middle is not uh, a bad idea, at least in my experience. And there are three C's to impeachment. The first C is commit the witness to her testimony today on the stand. The second C is credit the witness's prior statement. And the third C is confront the witness with the prior statement. So a word or two on each of the three C's. Start with the first C, commit. There's a fundamental question when it comes to commit. Some textbooks kind of use a one-size-fits-all for commit. I don't. Um, I ask myself this question to begin with. Is the prior statement in and of itself consistent or inconsistent with my theory of the case? What's an example of a prior statement that's consistent with my theory of the case? I need in a traffic case for the traffic light for the northbound traffic to have been red. The witness previously said red, today is saying green. In that situation, that prior statement in and of itself is consistent with my theory of the case. What's an example of a prior statement that's not consistent with my theory of the case, but I would still want to use it in a trial? When I was a prosecutor, I prosecuted a guy for bank fraud. He had an alibi witness who said that he was with him that night at a party. At the second trial of the same case, that witness got on the stand and said he was with the witness at home. First time party, second time at home. Now, 
Neither of those is consistent with my theory of the case. My theory of the case was that he was at an ATM that night making unlawful withdrawals. But the juxtaposition of those two destroys the witness's credibility. So that's an example of a prior statement that while in and of itself doesn't help me, does help me when taken in context. So if the statement, the previous statement, is consistent with my theory of the case, the light was red, then in that situation, that was the right answer for me. And the witness may be untruthful today, but was previously truthful. In that situation, I attack the testimony of the witness today. I attack the testimony of the witness today. But in that second situation, where the prior statement in and of itself is inconsistent with my theory, but shows that the untruthful witness cannot keep their story straight from one falsity to the next, in that situation, I attack the witness. So let's use this example of when the prior statement is consistent with our theory. Our theory is that Jones never had a knife. On direct, the witness says, Jones had a knife. I've got to commit. Cross. Mr. Jones never had a knife. Witness is going to say, yes, he did. But what have I done? I've still committed. Why did I do it that way? Why did I do it that way as opposed to saying, which I could have done, so it's your testimony today that Jones had a knife? Well, the reason I like to do it this way is because I didn't like hearing that Jones had a knife the first time they said it on direct. So why do I want to repeat it on cross? I'm going to put that statement my way. Jones never had a knife. Answer, yes, he did. The witness is still committed to their testimony today. Now the second C is credit. This is where, in this situation, we're going to build up that prior statement. So you previously made a statement to the police, or you previously signed an affidavit, or you previously testified at a preliminary hearing, or whatever the case may be. In a civil case, maybe it was a deposition. The witness says yes. The next question shows why that prior statement, the statement that's consistent with our theory of the case, is the truth. How are we going to credit it? Here's how. That previous statement was closer in time. It was fresher in your mind back then. It was made under circumstances where you knew it was important to be truthful. Now, we're not going to ask the witness that that, the question that way. But what we're going to say is, well, you made that prior statement to a police officer. You made that prior statement under oath. You made that prior statement in court. You knew it was important to be truthful. And it was the truth. What's the witness going to say? No, it was a lie. If they do that, they've destroyed themselves already. So that's how we credit that prior statement. Closer in time, or else we show the circumstances that make it more reliable. And then the third C is to confront the witness with the prior statement. If the prior statement is written or recorded, we show opposing counsel the statement or we tell counsel the page number of the transcript, we ask to approach the witness, and then we approach the witness and we say, the document I'm showing you is a copy of the statement you gave to the police, correct? or I'm showing you a copy of the transcript of your deposition. We've already asked them about the fact that you previously testified at a deposition. And we've laid out for them why that deposition was important. You were under oath. You knew what was going on. You signed it afterwards, whatever the case may be. And now we're saying, so I'm showing you a copy of that deposition transcript. Witness says yes. And then you say, I'm going to read from page 17, line 42, or I'm going to read from the second paragraph of your statement to the police, and you read along with me and make sure I read this correctly, okay? The witness will say, okay. Why do you read it? 
because you don't want to give the witness the opportunity to put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. You want to control the pace and you want to control the volume as that statement is being read. So you show them the document, you tell them you're going to read it, and then you read it slowly and with appropriate emphasis. And then you say, did I read that correctly? Witness says yes, and you are done. What if the statement's oral? Well, if the statement's oral, then use the witness's words as much as possible. You talk to the police right after the fact. And yes, I did, and you credit that. You knew it was important to be accurate. You were accurate, everything like that. And then you sit there and you say, and you told the police that Mr. Jones never had a knife. That's as close to the words that the witness used at the time. Now, if the witness says, yeah, I did tell him that, you're done. But if the witness doesn't tell, them, tell you that on the stand, then at that point, you have to bring in the police officer to testify. And when that police officer comes in to prove, the, prove up on that impeachment, you want to be able to have the officer use words that are as close to the words that you used on cross-examination. Did he tell you anything about a knife? Yes. What did he say? He said, Mr. Jones never had a knife. Same words or close to the same words, best you can with respect to that. So again, if the answer is anything less than yes, you're going to have to go with prove up by bringing in a witness after the fact. So let's talk now about that situation, that second situation we talked about, where the prior statement in and of itself is not consistent with our theory. Let's say the prior statement was, Jones had a hunting knife with a black handle and a six-inch blade. Today, the witness is saying Jones had a switchblade that was all silver. Of course, our theory is Jones never had a knife at all. Now, in this situation, to commit <clears throat> is a little bit different because commit here, we're going to basically repeat the direct. So do I understand your testimony today to be that Jones had a switchblade that was all silver? You can almost sound defensive, almost like you're hurt. Witness will sit there and say, that's right. All we've done is repeat the direct. Then what? What we want to do is we want to take that prior statement and we want to bring it to the same level as the testimony today. Not greater, because it's not more reliable, because we don't like either one. But we want to put them on equal level and show that at equal levels, they're both unbelievable. So how are we going to do that? You previously gave a statement to the police. Yeah. You knew you were supposed to tell the truth. Notice I don't say you told the truth. You were supposed to tell the truth. Or you previously testified under oath. Yeah. The same oath you took today. Why do I ask that question? Because I'm showing that the oath today was no more important to him or her than that oath before and that they gave conflicting statements under that oath. And so therefore, the fact that this witness is under oath today is not something that makes that witness believable. So you previously testified under oath, same oath you took today. Yeah. And then you confront, same as before. I'm going to show you a copy of that statement, show you a copy of the transcript, whatever. Notice, I don't take the statement and make it greater than the testimony, I simply keep them on even keel. And then proving up the impeachment. I've alluded to that already. Evidence Rule 613, what was sometimes referred to as the rule of the Queen's case, controls you can't impeach with extrinsic evidence unless the witness has been confronted. And you prove it by calling the appropriate prove-up witness. If you're calling a cop, for example, or any other witness, make sure the witness is going to be available. If it's a transcript, make sure that you've got a stipulation that the transcript is authentic. In civil cases, that's usually taken care of in pretrial. Criminal cases, you may need to make sure that that's not going to be a problem. Otherwise, you might have to call the court reporter. Now, impeachment by omission. The witness has just come up with something that was never in the witness's police report. I'll say if it's a cop. 
and you're sitting there and you're like, well, where did that come from? He just made that up. Impeachment by omission is simply a form of a prior statement that's consistent with your theory of the case. See, what you're saying is this. You're saying this police report includes everything that was important. He never said this before. Therefore, it did not occur. And if that's my theory of the case, that it did not occur, then that prior statement, whether it's a police report, an accident report, whatever the case might be, maybe it's an insurance agent's or uh, an adjuster's uh, report of certain uh, damage to a vehicle or something like that, whatever the case might be, it's a situation where if, the, if it's not in that prior statement, it didn't occur under our theory of the case. Because if it really happened, it would have been in the report. So impeachment by omission, if we think about it, that prior statement being consistent with our theory of the case, all we're going to do is the same thing we did before. So, question to the police officer who said he saw blood on the steps. There was no blood on those steps. First question, short, telling the jury what it is that we want the jury to believe. Police officer says, yes, there was. Police officer is committed to the testimony that he's just given on direct, and we've now committed him on cross. So now we have to credit. You previously prepared a police report about your observations at 1341 Hilliard. Yes. What are we going to do? We have to credit that report. Tell the jury why that report is the truth. It's an official report. You're trained on how to prepare reports. You're evaluated on how well the reports are written. You know that that report will be needed to be relied upon either by yourself or by police officers in the future. And you know from your training that that report is to include all important facts. Those are your points. That, now you've credited the prior report. And now you confront. This is your report. Yes. And you show them that report and you say, and there is no mention of blood on the steps anywhere in that report, is there? And he's going to have to say no. Now sometimes... And this is where we use our emotions. If the officer has come off squirrely or this insurance adjuster or whoever it is who's written this has come off as if they're biased, you might get a little tougher with them in that situation. This is your report. The only report you read, or wrote, rather. I'm going to hand you this red pen. Why don't you circle for me where in this report there is one mention of blood on the steps. When that type of emotion is appropriate, use it. But make sure you're using your emotions. Your emotions are not using you. There's some pitfalls in impeachment. You have to be ready for them. Make sure you take the statement in context. You can't, for example, impeach with an omission about from a deposition transcript where the witness wasn't asked the question. You can't say to the witness, you gave a deposition, you never said this, if the witness was never asked that question. Okay? Make sure that you don't say something or see something in the first paragraph of a police report or some other type of a narrative that's contradicted in the second paragraph and you've gone ahead and opened the door. Because, you know, the rule of completeness under the rules of evidence will allow your opposing counsel to even ask for that ex next paragraph to be read at the same time that the witness is reading the first paragraph within the judge's discretion in order to show proper context for what was going on. Make sure that when you're impeaching with something, you're not opening the door to having the rest of the document becoming admitted if you don't want the rest of that document being admitted. Now, it shouldn't be the case that it necessarily would be, but look at the document, think about the hearsay implications, think about the relevancy implications, and go through and 
figure out whether or not you have to worry about opening up the door. I can't really give you specifics about that one necessarily because every case is going to differ with respect to that. And it may very well be that part of it's determined by rulings in limine that have already been made. Maybe a judge has said, no, I'm not going to allow such and such a report to come in unless, counsel, you open the door. Well, in that situation, be ready for the fact that if you impeach with this kind of an omission or impeach with a prior inconsistent statement, you may be opening up that door and you have to think about that. And Maybe you have to approach the bench first and say, Your Honor, I need to go into this. Jury needs to hear this. I don't think that opens the door, but I'd like you to give me a uh, ruling right now, if you would. And the judge may or may not accede to your request. Never let the witness read. As I said, you lose control. And avoid gilding the lily. Don't sit there and ask the next question. So were you lying then or are you lying now? Because the witness will look at you and say, you know, I made a mistake then. But I'm telling the truth today. Don't give the witness that opportunity. That gilding the lily, that gloating, that's that one question too many. See, the bottom line is get in and get out. Okay, let's talk about a couple of final thoughts and we'll wrap it up. You want to start strong, you want to end strong. Start with the positives if there are any. Start with something that's less controversial but important. Because at this point you're still friendly with the witness. So if there are some points on which you agree that you need to bring out, not just to unnecessarily repeat the direct, then in that situation Start with the less controversial but important and build up. Bias is a good place to end when you're attacking a witness. And so you're the defendant's mother. In fact, sometimes bias is all there is to your cross-examination. I had a situation one time where a uh, defendant called his girlfriend to the stand. He was all concerned that the jury was going to hold it against him that he had an expensive car. It was a drug case. She gets up on the stand and she explains that the car was a gift she gave to him because she had won money on Wheel of Fortune or some such thing like that. I had no idea whether that was the truth or not. Criminal discovery was very limited back when I was trying this case in 1988. I had no idea whether that was the truth or not. My cross-examination was nothing more than saying, you're the defendant's girlfriend? Yes. Thanks so much for coming. Bias in that case was not only the ending point, it was the beginning point. Notice you don't ask questions like, do you love him? That doesn't help you. Would you lie for him? All you're going to get out of those kinds of questions are, I love him, but I'll never lie for him. And so you don't want to give the witness those opportunities. I got what I needed for purposes of cross-examination. As I said before, I don't tend to finish with impeachment as a general rule. Bottom line of cross-examination is that you're staying true to your theory of the case, you're maximizing control, you get in and you get out. And that's probably a good place for me to get out to. Thanks so much for listening.